Hello my friends, Daniel Mitson Short here and today I have an interview for you with someone I've known for a couple of years. Her name is Ashley Bendixson. She's a speaker, an author, a coach and a consultant and she specializes in helping people overcoming domestic violence in relationships and to basically move forward in their lives in a positive way. Ashley has overcome some incredible challenges in her own life. She's had some amazing achievements and her story is quite inspirational. I found it very encouraging and very hopeful talking to her. And uh, I think you'll enjoy this. If you're a person who has been through that kind of struggle yourself, I think you'll get a lot from what she has to say. And also her personal story is one that's well worth listening to and um, you know, using as inspiration in your own life. So thank you once again, Ashley, for doing the interview. I really appreciate your time and insights. I'll link below to Ashley's website and information if you'd like to get in contact with her. And as always, I hope you enjoy the interview. Thanks for watching and enjoy. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for being here with us today. I was very excited to have you on the show and to get to know a little bit more about your experiences and, and the amazing things that you've done over your career. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be connecting with you. Yeah, it's great. I know we spoke several years ago more so about speaking and, you know, I've always admired your journey as a speaker and particularly the topics you speak about. So it's been great to kind of see the growth and development you've had. And now hopefully we can talk a little bit more about your journey. I'd love to get into a bit of detail, but to begin with, um, I always ask this question, how do you describe, you know, yourself and what you do when you meet people for the first time? <laughs> You know, I think this is something I will forever struggle with. I, I tend to just lead in to the conversation by saying, I'm a full-time speaker. <laughs> and then yep. people are like, wow, you know, what do you speak on? And I know like in the world of business, they're like, you should have a, a statement. Like I help people do this by doing right. this. And I'm like, I'm a speaker. <laughs> and, um, and then when they ask me what on, that's kind of when I, I explain that um, my expertise is in domestic and sexual violence prevention and that I really focus heavily on speaking in the youth market. So I teach healthy relationships to young adults and I uh, educate the adults in their lives to um, know how to how to look out for them and guide them and protect them but because this is my expertise i also will often train first responders victim services professionals i've trained the military and just a lot of different diverse audiences but that's kind of my my work in a, in a nutshell at least it was pre covid it's changed a little bit but um now i'm actually offering more in my business because i think for me a silver lining is now that I'm not spending so much time in airports, on the road, in hotels, I can actually uh, implement more coaching and programs and one-on-one -on -one work, which I didn't have the time for before. So yeah, so that's what I'm doing now, speaking and coaching. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, congratulations for making that pivot as well. I know it's been a tough year for a lot of speakers, so we'll probably get into that as we go through. So when you started your career way back when, did you have different ambitions than, I mean, you know, from where you are today? Did you always want to go in this area or was it very different? I had no clue that speaking was even a career path. To be honest, I, I feel like the work I'm doing really chose me. Um, you know, it, it kind of was born out of my own adversity and hardships. And, you know, I, I can remember having this feeling that I, I knew I was meant to serve people and that I wanted to help others, but I really didn't know what career um, that would take on. So I had a passion for criminal justice. You know, that's what my degree is in. And um, on, on the side, I was just speaking as an act of service to help others. And before I knew, I started to research speaking as a full-time you know, profession and people were doing it and making significant money and making an impact and making a living doing this. So yeah, I just kind of delved into it more and one day quit my nine to five and, and did speaking full-time. <laughs> yeah, the dream, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know to kind of change tone here a little bit, one of the questions, which is part of your story, is that I know when you were young, you had a very traumatic experience, which kind of led you to the speaking that you do today. And without, you know, delving too deep into the details, would you mind sharing a bit about what that was and how that changed you? Yeah, so I, I'm a survivor myself of domestic and sexual violence. And um, just to kind of make a long story short, it was a, a cycle of repeated abuse and just unhealthy relationships that I experienced from age 14 to 20. And those unfortunate relationships were so damaging that 
you know, as a teenager, I struggled with disordered eating habits and a low self-esteem and anxiety and my grades were dropping and um, just my whole life kind of crumbled. And then even later in college, similar situation where, you know, my grades were failing. I was in this abusive, toxic relationship, not taking care of myself and my goals. And at the end of that whole period, it left me homeless, a college dropout, penniless. And unfortunately, I was severely physically harmed. And, you know, it just kind of was this moment of rock bottom um, that, you know, I, I knew I had two choices, right? I could continue to struggle and uh, remain a victim, or I could survive and uh, try to thrive in my life and use this as a launching pad. And um, it really just inspired me to want to turn my whole life around, um, which is kind of why I do what I do today. Yeah, it's an incredible journey you've been on. And I think it, it's so admirable that you were able to, you know, at the bottom of things, see that, that you know, I can actually turn things around because I think a lot of people get stuck in, like you said, a cycle, you know, and they, they can't sort of see a, see a way out of it. So, yeah, that's that's incredible that you were able to do that. Yeah. Did you, um, when when you started to kind of you know come out of that period and, and find your way, what was the first inkling that you had that you wanted to share your experiences? You know, what what drew that out of you? You know, um, it's interesting because at first I knew I wanted to help other people who had gone through similar situations, but I never considered using my story as that tool. Um, you know, everybody has a very different healing process and journey that they go on. And one of the things I thought would help me would be to start actively giving back. And so I began volunteering at a local domestic violence agency, like naively thinking they'd let me mentor, you know, like survivors, but they just had me answering reception calls. And I was, I was okay with that. You know, my foot was in the door and it was about, a, I would say about nine months in where they said, you know, we have this annual event every year. We always look for a few survivors to speak. And would you be willing to share your story? And I said, yes, I was excited. I was honored that they asked me. But then once it really sunk in that I was going to be telling something so vulnerable to my community, to like the mayor, I mean, it was, uh, it was pretty terrifying because I hadn't really owned that survivor title yet, that this was something I should be, you know, proud that I had overcome, I still felt a lot of shame around it. So it kind of just happened um, by me being asked and, and reminding myself that the story is more important, like this story is going to help others. And so I just, yeah, I was given this, this one chance, terrified, like wrote my whole story out, read it on, you know, pages of paper. Um, but from that moment on, people in the audience thanked me and, and it led to a few other local community events and can you speak to this girls group and these kids over here at this after school program? And uh, I've been speaking ever since. Yeah. Wow. You know, there's so much in what you just said. I think like number one, being willing to volunteer, that was a huge thing, you know, getting, getting into that arena of actually helping others who've been through a similar situation that in itself is significant because so many people don't think about, you know, I've had this difficult time. How can I help others who've had the same time? So that's mm -hmm. amazing. And then on top of that, to have the courage, not only to face the fear of sharing this traumatic experience, but then also speaking, you know, people, I know, cause I'm a speaker, <laughs> people say, I could never do what you do. I'm terrified of public speaking, right? And so you had like the double thing of I'm speaking in front of a group <laughs> and sharing this, you know, experience. What was that like? Just, I mean, that must've been a huge hurdle. And, <laughs> it was, and I, I think it was just, I mean, I had to get out of my own way. I had to keep reminding myself of why I said yes and why I was doing this and make that more important than my fears. Um, but you're right, it, it, was a, it was a mental process to go through, but it was also one of the, the most empowering moments of my life up to that point. And I remember thinking like, I, I can do anything. I can be a voice. I can take that power back that was taken from me and, and do good. And it just kind of showed me what's possible. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Whenever I've spoken about a topic where I've spoken from the heart, that's the most difficult thing to do on, you know, on stage, yeah. especially if you're emotional or you're vulnerable and it's in front of a huge crowd, <laughs> you know, that's not easy, but it's so rewarding as well. There's something that amplifies it somehow. You get so much back in terms of, yeah, just the, just the feeling of that you're alive, you know, when you do that. 
So yeah. yeah, and it's so interesting because even like looking back at the evolution of my speaking career, you know, that first time I was asked to speak, it was tell your domestic violence story. And then the more I began speaking and telling my whole story, sometimes I was saying things out loud on a stage for the first time ever. You know, yeah. it would just come out that, you know, this actually started when I was 14 and I was sexually assaulted. And I, I said that publicly for the first time and, and I just started crying on stage, you know, yeah. just, it was such a, it was so like integral to my own healing was telling my story. And um, I really did work through all of it sometimes on the stage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I've obviously never been in your situation, but yeah, there's been a lot of, you know, things that I've kind of had my own self therapy out on the stage as well. <laughs> you know, yeah. like you need to, like you would do with a therapist, you kind of just, oh, well, this audience is going to hear all about it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So now when you started speaking, you mentioned that you did get some offers to speak to youth groups and things like that. Was that something that you really enjoyed? Is that why you started to specialize in that area? Or was there any particular reason why you chose younger audiences as your target? Um, it kind of just happened naturally. Um, you know, typically, I mean, I was very involved in my community. As the years went on, I fell in love with volunteering. And a lot of times I was working with nonprofits and area youth organizations, and it kind of just happened. And I think at the time, it's where my story was the most relevant, because I was telling my story of struggles as a teenager. So I think it was very obvious to me that 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 was the audience that needed me the most. Yeah. And then, you know, like any career, you sometimes you you incorrectly start to think about like, well, where where is there more money and opportunities? And I I strayed off that path for a while and tried to do more corporate talks and leadership talks, and it just did not feel right at all. So um, now I'm just back to where I started, you know, speaking pretty much full time to youth. That's like ninety percent of my speaking. Yeah, it's incredible. And I heard, I think I saw yesterday you spoke to a group virtually of around 850 students. Is that right? I did. Yeah, it was a virtual youth conference. So I, I gave a virtual keynote. <laughs> incredible, yeah. And that's the incredible thing I think that we have these days through the, you know, even though we can't speak person to person through Zoom and, you know, different virtual conferences, you never know who you can impact. And I mean, that's a sizable audience for anyone. So yeah, to do it. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. I mean, the virtual stuff, you're, I mean, there's an opportunity to reach even more students, you know, multiple schools can pool together and, and stream something. So there's yeah. definitely been some silver linings to, uh, to going virtual for sure. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I, I kind of miss what you said too, about, you know, the travel part of it. I think as a speaker, it is kind of one of the perks of what we do is we get to see mm -hmm. the world and that type of thing. But yeah, I think the, uh, the benefit of not traveling, like you said as well, is that you can kind of focus on other projects. You have more time and energy to devote instead of kind of being wiped out from traveling so much, you know, even though it is fun, it, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> so, it does. Yeah, mm -hmm. Definitely. So now you also have a nonprofit organization, right? Um, I used to, I have, um, I have like a social impact like project. So I, I do run an online storytelling platform for survivors, but it's not incorporated in, in any way, but it's a global platform. I've collected over 300 stories from survivors across the, the world. And um, it's really just a kind of a blog platform for other people to share their stories and heal through telling their stories, um, as well as creating a sense of solidarity. Because I think, something you probably relate to this as a speaker you know you go out and people come up from the audience and say oh my gosh it's like you're telling my life story or yeah. i feel like you totally understand me and that is so validating for someone who feels alone mm -hmm. and i would have survivors come up and say you know how can i use my story to help other people how can i kind of do what you're doing but not get up on a stage and so that's what kind of birthed this whole idea was to create this this story hub where people could share and learn and um, help others. Yeah, that's great. And it's, you know, I remember this maxim I heard years ago that the more personal something is, the more universal it is. So if you yes. have something that happened to you as a person, you might think, oh, no one wants to hear this. But, you know, in platforms like that, where you can share it even anonymously, you don't know who else will have that same, that, that same experience. And, and, you know, it might be a very universal thing. So yeah, that's great that you've created that. Um, I, I forgot to ask you just a little question about the speaking to 
youth because I haven't had a lot of experience doing that. I've done a couple of youth kind of talks, but I'm more of a, I don't know, grown up speaker, I suppose, <laughs> and, um, talking to boring adults. Um, do you find, is there, is there ex, you know, like unique challenges for that age group that you speak to? Anything that you, you had to, you know, adjust your speaking style or skills or anything? I think the biggest challenge, well, I'll say there's two. So um, one is definitely that they are judging you before you even begin to speak. Right. Um, the second year there, they like if they're in an assembly, usually they're like, great, what are we gonna have to listen through? What's this chick gonna <laughs> talk about? Who is she? So you're, they're already like, uh, they're already opposing you. Yeah. But I think that's one of the most exciting parts about speaking to youth because then within just a few minutes, I can tell like I have them. Or they, they're like, all right, she's kind of cool. Or she's kind of funny. Or like, okay, like I, I want to learn more about this. Yes. And then the second challenge, of course, is, um, and, and this is really something that, you know, uh, the people that book speakers will say is, you know, we really want to make sure you keep them engaged. And if it's, you know, 45, 60 minutes, like how do you keep them engaged for that long? And um, so that's like something unique too. Whereas, you know, adults don't mind sitting back and listening for an hour to a speaker, especially if they're at a conference they're paying for. But um, you really have to be a little bit more animated, a little, a little bit more entertaining. You have to use the stage more to all keep right. kids' attention. Um, yeah. But like anything with practice, I mean, it all just comes naturally now. So I yeah. love it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the, the very few youth events I've done, I've noticed there was a lot more kind of chatter and giggling and you know things like that. And, and they're not as socialized as adults or as adults can pretend to be interested, you know. <laughs> kids can't pretend to be interested so they'll show you on their face when they don't care you know so it's it's tough yeah. you have to really adjust but i think as anyone who does youth speaking you know you are like the apex of speakers because tr trying to maintain that attention and that, <laughs> flip them over to your side you're right it's you know it's a big challenge so yeah respect um yeah I've, i very rarely have had an audience where like they're talking or not listening to me and like the few times it's happened i can almost tell it's like the school's culture too like the kids yeah. just um, but th that's like one of the best pieces of feedback that I'll hear is they're like, oh my gosh, the kids, you could have dropped a pin and, and heard a pin drop and, yeah. or they were just on the edge of their seat, like the whole time, like nobody, you know, and it's, and that's, that's what you hope for. I mean, that's the art of, you know, powerful storytelling is to get people at the edge of their seats. Definitely too. And I think, you know, because you are being vulnerable, sharing your real experiences and, and there's a genuine desire to help. I think at any age, people resonate with that. You know, you're not some sort of hokey motivational speaker or something. You're, you're actually talking about something that's very important. So people immediately, they give you that respect as well, I would assume. Yeah. And, you know, speaking about dating, I mean, teenagers are like, they love the chance to talk about this. And it's, it's a topic that most parents don't talk to their kids about. And there's no classes in school on healthy dating. But when I start talking about, you know, if your boyfriend or girlfriend is blowing up your phone or, or demands your Instagram passwords or wants you to share your location or is always checking in, I'm like, that's not, that's not fun. And they're, they're like, you're right. You're right. Cause they deal with this. If it's not them, it's their friends. I mean, the role of technology now, but you know, the kids will say to me, you know, I'm so glad you were here because like these issues happen all the time. And, you know, my friend's in a bad relationship and she's got, you know, an eating disorder right now. And she hates, you know, so they really appreciate someone like talking about real life issues that matter to them. Mm, that's huge. And I know I, I didn't sort of prepare you for this question, but is this something that you think's got more difficult for teenagers with the, you know, inclusion of technology in their lives, you know, with having Instagram and social media and all that type of thing? I do because I, I don't think it allows for um, boundaries when it comes to time and space and independence. You know, it's like when we were younger, it's like if you were dating someone, they could call your house. And if you weren't home, that was it. They had to wait till you got home and right. mom and dad said so-and-so called. But now it's just this like expectation of 24 seven access to somebody. Yeah. And there's location monitoring. There's, I'm going to look at your social media posts and who's this person commenting on it? And how do I know if you're cheating? And it, there's just this whole new dynamic. And then the other big piece is, you know, in unhealthy relationships, a lot of times there's, there's threats, you know, I'll, I'll share this information, I'll post this, I'll say this. And, you know, yeah. back in the day, someone wants to spread a rumor or say something nasty about you, it might take a week before, you know, a percentage of people heard about it. Now you post something on Instagram, and the whole school will know tomorrow. So yeah. there's a lot of different ways that technology has, uh, has come into this whole 
field of work that I speak on. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, I didn't, yeah, I didn't ever experience that. I remember having to, you know, if I liked a girl, I had to literally call her house and speak to her dad. And, you know, <laughs> right. and, you know maybe you'd get through, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's totally different these days. And mm -hmm. that comes with downsides too. Yeah, that's well, it's so wonderful that you're, you know, bringing awareness to that. And also the parents, so they can see the cycle happening and perhaps, you know, potentially catch it before it gets too much worse. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's amazing. So another thing that I wanted, you have so many things that you do. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, the book that you wrote just recently. I know it just got released, The the Language of Time, I believe it's called. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so I published that um, during the summer of the pandemic. So also a gift that came out of uh, some changes, but it is, um, it's a memoir. It has nothing to do with my line of work, but very much to do with my life. And I feel like it's been a, a labor of love to write this book. So it's a memoir, um, basically chronicling eight years that I spent taking care of my mom, who oddly, bizarrely, uh, unexplainedly developed Alzheimer's at 48 years old. Mm. And uh, so I was in my early 20s and instantly took on this role of, of caregiver for her. And I've always journaled as part of just my own self-care. And so I was jotting down stories from every single day. I was video recording her and blogging a little bit. And I knew someday I would want to turn this story into a book. So it's basically a memoir on caregiving, but also uh, really like emphasizing the importance of being present, being in the moment, uh, not letting, you know, life pass you by, that every moment is precious and, and really just making the most of time while we have it. Yeah, yeah, how incredible. And it's so wonderful that you could compile that into something that, again, other people can use and, you know, experience because your personal experience is universal, you know, and I've, I've had, uh, you know, family members who are quite a bit older than that who've had Alzheimer's, so I understand, you know, some of the difficulty of it, but when someone's so young like that, that's so incredibly, you know, challenging to deal with. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to interview you was because I think you've had all these incredible difficulties that you've overcome. And, you know, from the times I've met you, you always seem, I'm sure it's not all the time, but you seem very upbeat and, you know, someone who's sort of forward thinking and resilient. Is that something that you feel like, did that build in you because of the experiences you had? Or was that something that was just always in you, this desire to kind of rise from the ashes, so to speak? <laughs> you know, I think... Um... I mean, I, I do a lot of personal development work. So I look back and I analyze who I am and who yeah. I was before it all. And I do think that I've always had this optimism. I've always had uh, a, a reserve of resilience that I, I knew was within me that I could always get through tough things. Yes. But I think for a while, um, I sometimes didn't know I had a choice to change something today versus just, oh, once this all ends, I'll, I'll be okay. You yeah. know, story of my life, I'll get through it. But I definitely realized, um, so I had this moment when everything came crashing down and finally everything ended, you know, at rock bottom, I was leaving a courthouse, you know, where my ex was being arraigned, having just assaulted me. And I just remember having this like moment of intuition where this voice came to me and was like, Ashley, now go, like move forward. This chapter needs to close. It was never you, it was everyone else. And I knew that if I continued to struggle, my ex would continue to win. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, then that means the boyfriend at 14 still wins and everybody that's ever harmed me. And I just knew like, you don't get to have that power over me. And I think that concept is just something that's deeply embedded in me. So anytime something difficult happens, I think, you don't get to choose how I feel. You don't get to dictate my life or what happens next. I still have power and choice and I can choose to find a positive, an opportunity, uh, a silver lining, like I've been saying. And maybe that's how I cope with hard things. I'm like, well, I'm gonna start a nonprofit. You know, I'm gonna go do some activism and some advocacy work. I mean, I just, I go into like hyper mode with, uh, yeah, with all these positive ideas. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. I love that idea that they can't, you know, by you succeeding, by you moving on, they don't, they no longer control you, you know, and obviously a lot of people haven't been through the experiences you've been through, but they might have people in their life who criticize them or, you know, people who cause setbacks for them or something like that. And I think that's a great attitude to think, you know, if I move forward, that person no longer controls me or dictates what I do. Yeah. yeah. Very and really saying, you know, how did this happen for me in some way? What did I gain from that experience mm -hmm. or what can I now give forward from that experience. I mean, 
one super quick little story. So right after my mom passed, within a month, my friend and I, this was my nonprofit, we launched a theater company in my mom's memory. And three years later, we had done six shows and donated 30 grand to charity from our productions. Yeah. So it's like, if you're willing to say like, what opportunities exist right now? How can I use this experience to create something to serve? Uh, amazing opportunities show up. So yeah. Yeah, that's so Silver good. I'm also, I'm also hearing there the theme that you give back to others very readily, you know, which is maybe counterintuitive in a way because the tendency is if we've had difficult times is to kind of turn inwards, right? And be like, oh, I need to care for myself. But you're actually flipping the script a little bit and saying, I'm going to give to other people in some way, you know, contribute. And maybe that also, I don't know, is, is that part of the healing, do you think, for you? I think it is. Um, I think... I unintentionally, you know, very early on chose to give back, not knowing that it was going to actually support me. Um, you know, it's like, it's a selfless act, but then you end up reaping the benefits personally as well. Um, it's either that, or I just, um, I'm a people pleaser. I'm a giver. And I, <laughs> sometimes I think I probably should take a moment to give to myself a little bit too. And that's, you know, what I'm working on as I working through as I get older, but, um, yeah, you, you, you gain by helping others for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, it's very admirable. So yeah, thank you for the contribution that you make. Um, so last question I have for you, and it's kind of like a, a heavy question, I suppose, but do you have a sense of legacy in your life or, you know, what it is that you would like to leave behind, you know, your, your life's work, what you'd like to contribute to the world? I have been, I feel like I've been turning the idea of legacy over for over a decade now, since I really started on this journey of, of service. And it continues to evolve. Um, I think I definitely want to radically transform people's lives. You know, I mean, I think of like the, the people I've encountered that gave me my own moments of awakening and now I'm a different person because, because of it. So I hope that I, um, I hope that I am that person to other people. You know, I want to make a mark in the world of, you know, shining a light on domestic violence, especially among young people where it happens the most. Yeah. But now I think, um, and this is like what I was saying about doing a lot of personal development work. Sometimes I'm like, is me coming up with my legacy, just my own ego? And how do I, <laughs> right? And like, how, how do I access my highest self? And maybe that's like, forget the legacy show up and serve and be authentic and listen to your intuition and, and let the universe guide you. And then maybe naturally the legacy follows, right? Just by me being aligned and me being me in the wholest, most, you know, purest way for others. So still figuring that out, but I know I want to make an impact on people's lives. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you already are. That's why I asked that question is whether you have that sense already that, you know, you are contributing to people and making a difference because it seems that you are. So I hope that you're feeling that as well. It's interesting. You said too, about, you know, when people will come up to you when you've spoken in an audience and say, wow, you know, you spoke right to me. You know, when I first started as a speaker, I was very much about winning the whole crowd. You know, I had mm -hmm. to be the adulation and the you know, claps and the laughs and whatever. And then as I grew as a speaker, I realized it's when that one person comes up to you afterwards and says, thank you for saying that. I needed to hear it. That's the success, you know, and mm -hmm. I think really in everything that you do, that's the same type of thing where, you know, you, of course, you're, you know, you're speaking to big audiences, like 850 kids yesterday, but you're impacting, you know, one person who just needed to hear the message. So yeah, that's, that's, that I believe, well, from my perspective, that would be a legacy that I think you're offering. So. Yeah. And there always is at least one person in any audience that relates to you, gains something from you. And, yeah. you know, I, I do know that in, because I speak on such a difficult topic, I mean, some of the disclosures I get are students who are telling me they were assaulted or they're being abused and they then go to a counselor and someone gets reported. I had a, a middle school student once who told me that she had been sexually assaulted by an older male that was friends with her cousin or something like that. And she ended up going to the district attorney and he was then being prosecuted and she, she got the help she needed. And she was only like 12 or 13, but she never felt like she could tell anyone. And so it's those moments where you're like, this is why my why would I do matters? This is why getting out of my own way and using my story to help others matters. So yeah, it's, it's meaningful work. 
Yeah, that's incredible. I always, I always feel like, you know, the, the speaking I do is mostly around like technology and how it changes their behavior. You know, my big breakthrough is someone says, I'm going to stop using my phone and pay attention to my son. I'm like, yay. Whereas yours is like, you know, I'm stopping people from these abuse cycles. So yours is <laughs> much more significant, but yeah. Well, it, I don't it, know. It, I, I would beg to differ on that. I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, how someone react, how someone acts in their home models behaviors for their children. And, you know, you're a kid that grows up and dad's never engaged. And then, you know, you grow up and you're dating people who are that, who neglect you emotionally, you know, cause it's all, you know. So I think you're part of a, a huge, hugely important, valuable thing. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. I'll, I'll take that perspective too. And I, I love mm-hmm. the idea of like letting go of the legacy is, you know, it's an ego thing. So that's another breakthrough I got to think about because <laughs> you know, I've, I've had that kind of, you know, I'm, I'm 43 now. So I'm like, what's my legacy, you know? So I got to be, yeah, maybe let it go. <laughs> that's great Trust. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, now if people want to learn more about you and the work you do and maybe, you know, have you as a speaker at an event, how would they get in contact with you? Yeah. Best way is my website. There's more information on there than there should be, but you can learn all about me at ashleybendixon.com. All of my speaking programs are on there, my book that we referenced, my coaching. And of course I'm on almost all the social medias, uh, just at Ashley Bendixon. And I, I'm always here to answer questions, um, to provide resources, advice, support. And for anybody who wants to maybe share their story on my other platform, that is blueheartsproject.com. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you again for taking the time today. I knew the lessons that you've learned in your life and, you know, the, the message that you share just through your actions, I think is very inspiring for a lot of people who are watching this. So thank you for all you do. And thank you for being here today. Wonderful to see you again. Thank you for having me. Likewise. Thanks, Ashley. <laughs>